Well, uh, we are still in the book of Romans, and I know I don't have to go through uh, the fact that uh, you are studying it out and you are having your quiet times there. Uh, I know that's happening, so we won't even cover that. Uh, but uh, we've been talking about the theme of the book of Romans. And you say, well, what's the theme of the book? Well, you find it in Romans chapter 1. Paul says very simply in verse 16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to the last. Just as it is written in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 15, the righteous will live by faith. And the church said, Amen. this is powerful because this isn't the first time, as I just got through saying. This was, this was actually something that was said in the Old Testament. That the only way to be righteous is to live by faith. And I pray that you're still living by faith. Are, are you still living by faith? You know, we, we can put our faith in ourselves. But we in ourselves are not righteous. We can put our faith in our intellect. But no one's as intellectually intelligent as God Almighty. We can put our faith in what we've done and what we say and all our sacrifice. But to obey is to better than, better than to sacrifice. We've got to put our faith in Jesus Christ right there. Are you with me here? And this is the argument that Paul makes in Romans chapter 1 and really all through the book of Romans. He'd been a Christian for 20 years. He had been stoned. He had been beaten. He had been shipwrecked. He had even been put in a situation where he was, he was without clothes and, and cold. And yet even at that stage when he could say, I'm done with being a disciple, he writes to the Romans and he says, even with all those things that have happened because of the gospel, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God. I mean, he just saw that all, every waking minute that he had was from the grace, was because of the grace of God. And he wanted to live a life worthy of the calling. And I love the word power. He says it's the power. Of course, the word power in Greek means dynamite. Paul says the gospel is the dynamite. It can blow any sin out of your life. And it's the argument that he makes. In chapter 2, he goes on to talk about the Jews, but at the end of chapter 1, verse 18, and on he makes the argument that the Gentiles are lost he says the whole world is lost but he says the Gentiles are totally and completely lost why they don't have the law they don't have the Bible and because they don't have the Bible they're not conscious of sin but so they're lost but then he says those that don't have the Bible those that don't have the law you have it written on your heart in your conscience he says you don't even have to be a Christian to know right and wrong to some degree. He says every human being to some degree knows right and knows wrong. But because we don't live up to our conscience, we all fall short of our own conscience even. Are you with me here? We're not saved by our conscience. We're only saved by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. He says, so if you're a Gentile, you're, never, you're not even a Christian, you don't live up to your conscience, you're lost. So then he goes to the Jews, those who have the law, those who have the Bible. This could apply to us. And he goes, you got the Bible, you got the law, but you're not saved by the law just because you know the Bible, just because you know the scriptures, just because you know the Old Testament. That doesn't save you. You got to put your faith in Jesus. You need the forgiveness of your sins. So all Jews are lost. <laughs> he says all Gentiles are lost. All Jews are lost. And then we come to chapter 3. In verse 9 and he says something that's that's very interesting because what had crept into the church is some of the Jews kind of had a Jewish mindset you know hey we, we, we know the we know the law maybe maybe our acts of righteousness save us and Paul says this in verse 9 what shall we conclude then are we any better I mean the Jews thought they were better than the Gentiles because they had the Bible. I know you don't think you're better than anyone because you have the Bible. See, we're not saved because we have the Bible. We're not saved because we're, we're not any better than those who don't have the law, who don't have the scriptures. 
The only thing better are the decisions you make to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And he says, are we any better? Not at all. We've already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. No one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There's no one who does good. Not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. He says, this is just, I mean, this is the world we live in. The poison of vipers, the poison of bitterness, of anger, of rage, of racism, that's on the lips of people nowadays. And he simply says here, their feet are swift to shed blood. I mean, I'm, I'm saddened to, to, to inform you that only 10 countries in the entire world are not at war. Only 10 countries are not at war. We live in a time where everyone's so quick to shed blood. And if you really follow things, things are very tenuous with some of the things that have happened here politically. He says in verse 16, ruin and misery mark their ways. The way of peace. They don't know. There's no fear of God before their eyes. And he says this. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. I mean, he has to come and tell Jew, Gentile, that the whole world is held accountable to God. I read that and I go, oh my goodness. I am accountable to God. You are accountable to God. Whether you're Jew, whether you're Gentile, you are accountable to God. You go, well, I'm not a disciple. I'm not a Christian. It doesn't matter. That's the argument he's making. You are accountable to God, whether you're Jew or Gentile. Whether you have the law or you don't. Now, we have accountability in the church. We have accountability as a principle to help us get to heaven. I appreciate James Morgan. But your accountability is to God. You will be held accountable to God, whether you were living by faith and you put your faith in Jesus or you believed that Jesus rose from the dead. How many believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Everybody's going, where's this one going here? I don't want to get tricked. <laughs> been around Michael for a while what's he saying right here you believe that Jesus rose from the dead okay all right okay you, you believe that I believe that too that's not enough faith to save you is Yuri Zykov here today Yuri can you please stand up how many of you believe that's Yuri How many of you believe that Yuri is Russian and slash German? Yeah. Let's just, how many of you believe that Yuri someday is going to make it and he's going to become an evangelist? Yeah. Now let's just say right now, let's say the, you go ahead and sit down, bro. <laughs> let's say the Lord gave Yuri Zykov 20 million pounds to take a mission team to Germany. And he only could choose people here. With the 20 million pounds, you were only going to get a modest salary of 1 million pound a year. All other expenses were going to be paid by Yuri. Do you want to be on Yuri's mission team? You believe that Yuri's a preacher. Oh, yeah, he's a preacher now. But you'd have to go to Germany. Some of you don't even speak German. You're like, I go anyway, bro. I'm, I'm there. <laughs> How many would you go with him? Rick? Okay, there's a few of you. There's a few of you. Okay. You wouldn't, bro, yeah, bro, you wouldn't go with him, bro. Oh, my goodness. What if you found out Yuri was... 
Yuri was taking people to Germany with all that money, but he was driving the plane. See, it's a little different now, isn't it? You still believe that he is a preacher. You still believe that he is Russian. You still believe that, but you haven't. You, you only believe in Yuri when you're willing to get in that plane with him. Because now you have to put your trust in him. You have to put your life in his hands. And you have to trust he's going to get you to Germany. Are, are you with me here? Paul makes the argument. That it's not enough to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. You've got to believe in Jesus rising from the dead. You, it's not enough to believe that the Bible is the word of God. You've got to believe in the Bible. You've got to be willing to put your faith in what the Bible teaches. You've got to be willing to live by faith. Are you with me here? He says this here in verse 19. Or verse 21. It says, now righteousness from God apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law of the prophets testify. The righteousness from God come through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of what? The glory of God. And are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him, that's Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in the Holy Spirit, right? No, he says you have to have your faith in the blood. Not that the blood saves you. Your faith has to be in the blood. Are you with me here? And this is the reason why the false teaching of the Pentecostal church that tells you you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't save you. It's not the Holy Spirit that saves you. It's not putting your faith in the Holy Spirit. It's putting your faith in the blood of Jesus right here. And you only contact the blood of Jesus at baptism. He did this to demonstrate his justice. Because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did this to demonstrate his justice at the present time. So as to, to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. He says all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Earlier he says... The whole world is held accountable to God. You, th this is powerful because if we all are going to be held accountable, we need to know the age of accountability. We need to know when God looks a young woman in the eye, when God looks a man in the eye and says, you are accountable to me. We need to know that time. If the whole world's going to be held accountable, we, we, we need to know. Cause see, I think sometimes, can we come into our heart, we can go, okay, well... And, and let me say this, if anything I teach or show you is, is what God is saying, it's not me saying it to you, it's God speaking to you. If what I say is not in the Bible, don't worry about blow it away like shaft. But if it's in the Bible, God is speaking directly to you. And I want to persuade you to let your conviction be God's conviction. Take away your emotions, take away your feelings, and let the scriptures dictate what you believe. I'm talking to the Gentiles who don't have the law and those of you that have been around a long time that need to let the scriptures dictate what you do right here. Are you with me here? Yeah. So the whole world's held accountable to God. This is, this is very important because, you know, we go, I, I want my kids to be saved, for those of us that have children, but, you know, I don't want to put any pressure on them. I don't, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't, you know, I don't want them just to accidentally, like, you know, fall, just become a Christian. Just by osmosis. There, there are no scriptures that show the forceful advancement of the kingdom of God by osmosis. I, I've never seen that. But there's got to be a godly motivation for, the, for those of us that are parents to make sure our children are right with God. Our teenagers are right with God. Because the age of accountability is the same every single nation in the entire... Isn't that cool? The age of accountability is the same in Africa as it is in Asia, as it is in America, as it is here. It's the same all over the world. You know what age it is? Puberty. Puberty. It is at puberty that young men and young women have the full range of temptation. <laughs> they, 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 they don't just kind of struggle. They struggle with it all. Now, I probably, for me... I. 
I probably was lost when I was about seven or eight. I mean, I was a wicked little kid. I knew everything. I had a babysitter. I was like, she's really pretty. <laughs> I knew that at seven. I knew. Yet around the world, it, it, it doesn't change. It's puberty. It's the same time that every young man and young woman is held accountable to God. It's at puberty that young people begin to be double life disciples. You know what it is. You got your life, you know, you're at, you come to church and you're spiritual and then, you know, at school you got the peer pressure and you got the way you behave around, around, your, around your friends. You know, and this is very, very concerning. And we got to be making sure that we go, okay, wait a minute. I got to make sure my, my kids are right with the Lord. This is what I appreciate about, about our young brother Baba Tunde right there. Baba Tunde. Baba Tunde, he's 14 years old, but he goes, you know, I got this amazing uncle named Tommy Wall, but Tommy Wall, I'm not saved because of Tommy Wall. <laughs> I'm held accountable to God. And if I don't, if I don't, I know I want to be a part of the NBA where I do all the dunking. But I realize that if I have not let myself get dunked, I'm not going to heaven. And Baba Tunde got baptized a few weeks ago right there. Amen? <laughs> he understands he is accountable to God at 14 years old. I appreciate our, our, our young sister, Kiara. You know, Kiara, she, she's awesome. And, and I heard her conversion story. She had the full range of temptation right there. <laughs> And she, she understands. I, I got a pretty awesome dad named Michael Hart. Everybody loves him, and he's the Barnabas. He's, I got an awesome mom who looks like a campus student still. And, you know, I, I got this, you know, and I, you know, I got my brother Dylan. You know, he's an athlete and all this stuff. But if I die today, I'm accountable to God. And Kiara says, I got to get baptized. And she got baptized. She's a sold out disciple today. I appreciate Milka. I appreciate all of our young people. I appreciate, I, I, I mean, Milka. She goes, it, it's awesome that my, you know, look, Bradley got baptized. But listen, I need to get baptized. She's a young person. She understands. I'm held accountable to God. I even appreciate Carla Priscilla. You know, Carla Priscilla came to London to be with us. <laughs> Carla Priscilla, she's awesome. She so, so encouraged the church. And, you know, she came, she goes, I want to build my relationship with my dad. And yet she got here and realized she needed to build her relationship with her real dad. She didn't come to become a disciple. But Carlos got in there with her. I remember some of the talks. I remember some of the tears. I remember Carlos's heart going, wow, I just want my daughter to be right. I remember Carlos feeling like, wow, I messed up as a dad. I've made mistakes. But if there's one thing that Carlos had on his heart, he said, I want my daughter to be a disciple. And Carla Priscilla is a disciple today. She's a disciple. See, we, we, we need to understand, Satan begins very early working on your heart. He begins very early. And I want to persuade those of you that are in the fellowship, that are young. What would Jesus Christ say to you today if you died? If you have hit the age of puberty, would Jesus Christ say, well done, my good and faithful servant? Or would Jesus Christ say, you are not saved, you are not a disciple, you are on your way to hell? See, we, we just got to understand the whole world is accountable to God. The whole world is accountable to God. We've got to put our faith in Jesus Christ. You guys stay with me here? Okay, Romans chapter 4, check this out. It says, what then shall we say? Verse 1. That Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter. Of course, he's talking about, again, putting your faith in Jesus. He says, what, what, what do we have to say about Abraham? It says in it says, if in fact Abraham was justified by works. Again, that had creeped into the church. I'm justified by works. And of course, justification is justified never sinned. But you're only justified through Jesus. 
He's the only one that can just, your righteous acts don't justify you. But we try to justify ourselves, don't we? Look what I've done. Look what I've said. Look what I've sacrificed. And we can't justify ourselves. <laughs> You're only justified by Christ. He says, in fact, Abraham was justified by, if, if he was justified by works, he had something to boast about. But not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing. That when he speaks of the blessedness of man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against them. And the church said, "Isn't that make you happy that God won't count? When you, when you put your faith in God, not in works, that God won't count your sins against you. That, 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 that moves me. That moves me. It helps me to go, wow, God doesn't count my sins against me. And yet Paul drew the attention of the entire church back to the original radical father of faith. That's Abraham. So I just thought we got to we got to kind of have a right view of Abraham because I kind of I gave Abraham a little bit of a bad name during staff meeting. <laughs> and, and I said, Abraham's awesome. But, you know, he did this and did that. And I, I just I just I got to show you your father of faith in, in, in the Bible right there. Amen. So let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 12. We'll go back to the beginning. It's always good to go back to the beginning. We go old school right there. We got any old schoolers in the house? Uh-oh, there's George. That brother, brother George is there. He's old school. Okay, Genesis chapter 12. If you didn't catch my first point, it's simple. The whole world is held accountable to God. <laughs> Now's the time for the second one. You're called to have the faith of Abraham. You're called to have the faith of Abraham. Verse 1. The Lord had said to Abraham, leave your country. Let's stop right there. Remember, living by faith part two. That's the title of the lesson. What would you do if called to leave your country? Would you have the faith of Abraham? Or would you put your faith in your feelings or your flesh? We're starting France. And if you're a French speaker, I want to call you to have the faith of Abraham to go to France to build the kingdom of God. get sucked into the world this is all we got guys all we have is the kingdom that's it that's all that, that, that and let me tell you something it isn't something you sign up for it's something you die for because when you sign up for something you can break the contract it's a covenant it's not a contract you don't sign up for the kingdom you die for the kingdom are you with me here he says leave your country this is the faith of Abraham he had no, he didn't have a whole list of what the former fellowship did he couldn't go, well, you know, when they left their country last time, they made these. No, he had to, he's the only one. He, he didn't even have a, a group. He couldn't even go get discipled by some people. Bro, what do you think of this? He, he had to, it was him and God. It says, leave your country. Let's, let's make the message even a little bit more. Your people. He says, I mean, if Abraham was a black guy. And he was used to R&B music. Oh. Let me go to the UK. He was used to tribal, tribal, African, you know. Yeah, Ola. Ola's the one. Ola, have you ever seen Ola on the dance floor? Yeah. My goodness. That brother can move. He says you need to leave your people. That's the kind of faith you need to have. 
I mean, what, what would happen if you were an African guy? Called to be in a country where nobody was African. What would happen if you're a white guy? Called to be with a bunch of black guys. What, what would happen? You're an African guy. I mean, you're used to the jell off rice. I mean, you're fired up about some stewed chicken. I mean, you're just, I mean, this is what you do. You have some stewed chicken, you have some dumplings, you have some jell off rice. I mean, this, this is how life is. And now you're in another country. Roast beef. What's the, what's the, uh, what's the pudding? What's it called? Yorkshire pudding. <laughs> Gravy all over everything. <laughs> and a big sausage. <laughs> He says, you don't have faith in God if you have faith in your people more than you do in God. Yeah. And we live in a society where society tells you the answer is your people. Yeah. We need to Brexit. That's not the faith of Abraham. Check this sermon out. First, you got to leave your country. Then you got to leave your people. Then you got to leave your father's household. So you got to get a job. So stop living off your parents. Stop living in, in, in fear of what your parents think. You need to leave their household and grow up. It says, go to the land, I will show you. He didn't even know where he was going. <laughs> go to the land, I will show you. He got it. Can you imagine? You pack up everything, you leave your people, you leave everything, and then you get down to the airport and you, you say, what flight? I have no idea. And then they put you on a flight and then you, you, you realize, oh, this is awesome. I head to LA. No, you're going to Antarctica. Look at the deep level of trust in God Abraham had. Verse 2, I'll make you into a great nation. Well, that sounds great, but <laughs> just me right now, Lord. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. Yeah, it sounds good, Lord. It's not so great right now. <laughs> and you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham got some advice about the matter. He made phone calls, sent emails. He wanted everybody to be fired up and give it. No. Yeah. That's the book of emotional responses. So Abraham left as the Lord told him. Amen. That's powerful, isn't it? Yeah. He's called to have faith. Yeah. You know what's more challenging than him leaving his country? Leaving his people? <laughs> leaving the household? He's 75 years old! Yeah. He's 75! He's a veteran. Yeah. 75 years old before God begins working radically in his life. 75. And I, I just go, uh, I mean, we, we, we can be so wimpy sometimes. We get to 21, we've sinned, oh my Lord, my life is over. You don't know, oh I'm tired. I got class, you know, oh, you don't know what I've been through. You know what I mean? We get 25. Oh, man. Oh. Now, at 25, you've had a couple of relationships that haven't worked out. Now, oh, you've got some experience. Oh, my life is ruined. And don't let us turn 30 years old. 30 years old and I'm not married. 30 years old and... Oh my goodness, look at where my life is. Oh, I don't know if I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm 30. Then you get people that are really old, like over 40, like 48, 49, like Michael Hart and stuff like that. Those are the really old people. <laughs> God didn't even start working on Abraham until he was 75. Have 
away. God isn't done with you. You stop giving up. You stop going, oh, God is finished with me. He's just beginning to work in your life. He's just beginning to work in your life. That's why I love Jamie Gordai Hillary right there. I mean, Jamie Gordine, he, he, he takes a few bumbles in faith right there. He goes out to the Isle of Wight and he realizes, I'm alone. <laughs> I mean, it's awesome. You're at the Isle of Wight, but the kingdom of God isn't there. Jamie comes back to the, to the kingdom. He finds the church. He gets restored in the Lord. And the first thing out of his mouth, I want to be fruitful. I want to be used by God. I want to do something for God. I want to do radical things. Jamie has been saying, I want to do something for God ever since I first met him. Why? He understands that the righteous will live by faith. That God is not finished with him. How do I know that? Well, he says, you know, God can work in my life. God can give me a wife. God can work in my life. God can give me a wife. Now, God hasn't given him a wife. But he's given... Jamie Gradine, a pretty awesome girlfriend right there. <laughs> now, Hillary is secretly a leader. She doesn't want you to know that, but I'm just going to put it out there. She's secretly a leader. She's one of the only sisters, her and Jen Watkins, that were still standing strong here. They were there. They were here at the church planning. They were here. They were here. We're called to have faith. I appreciate Paul and Caroline right there. I mean, Paul looks like he's about 30 years old. He's not. Yeah, 32, 33. He's not. And Paul is going to be sharing what the cross means to him today. Pa Paul could have said, you know, I'm over the age of 40. Maybe God is finished with me. But he still kept seeking God. And as he began his search, he found a woman who had become a disciple already, Caroline. He found her. God put them together. Now they're engaged in the Lord, and they want to do great things for God. This is what it's all about. Amen? I, I want to persuade you to be willing to go anywhere, do anything, give up everything. And to be, be, be a disciple who's living by faith. God's not done with you. He's just getting started with Abraham. And he's 75 years old. Now, the wife is 65, so the sisters say... Okay, chapter 13. Let's go ahead and break it down. Now, chapter 13, we'll, we'll take a little journey here. Uh, this is where Abraham and Lot have to separate. Now, this is awesome. They had to go two totally different ways. Why? They had to build their regions. Abraham had a region, and Lot had a region. You know, it, it, it's one thing when you're, when you're, and here's the thing that Lot had to learn. Now I'm not with Abraham. I know I used to make fun of his sermons, but they, they actually were pretty convicting. And where do you get that nugget from? Where do you get that faith? Where do you get that joy? Where do you get all that? Abraham, I need some help. I need some training. No, now it was time for Lot to build his own region. And it was also time for Abraham to trust God, that God would use Lot. And they built regions. We're going to build regions in the church, are we not? Yeah. Are you fired up about that? Yeah. Amen. I'll let you read chapter 13 on your own, chapter 14. What happens right there? Abraham has to rescue Lot. Now, you know, we're going to regions here. I'm not, I'm not deceived. I know there's going to come a time where we have to rescue a lot of you. <laughs> Kingdom terminology is pull you back. Isn't that what we say, George? Pull you back. But we're not going to pull you back. We're just going to give you a little discipling and send you back on out there right there. So, so Abraham has to rescue Lot right there. And, and it was powerful because, you know, when you put your faith in yourself, it'll get you in trouble. <laughs> That's, we don't want to be in trouble. We want to be in faith. So he rescues him. And he pulls him on out. And then chapter 14, you know, and it, the, the, the other thing is er, here in chapter 14 is, as he, as he rescues him, uh, you know, Lot, I feel like, 
I think he got a little bit of a little, little autonomous in the heart. He got a little independent. And I think that's another reason why I need to be rescued. That's what independence will, will get you. We are not an autonomous church. Lot got a little autonomous. And, and this is not who we are. We do not believe in autonomy. For those of you visiting, autonomy is where everybody does what they see fit. And you're on your own. You're, in, you're your own little island right there. Lot got very autonomous and he needed to be. Independent spirit won't get you friends. Independent spirit, will, you'll feel alone. And this is exactly what happened with Lot. He gets rescued and it's all good. Uh, then we come to chapter 15. Chapter 15. This is the covenant. Learning a little bit about Abraham. Here. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Don't be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. That fired me up. He comes to Abraham. He says, number one, I am your shield. You don't have to worry about anybody else protecting you. You don't even have to protect yourself when your faith is in God. I am your shield. And then he says, I am your very great reward. Is that how you feel this afternoon? Your reward is in God. I think sometimes we want to get fired up for what we're going to get from God. And we're not rejoicing in the journey because we already got it. See, it's it's not enough to rejoice when you get something you want from God. You got to rejoice all the way along. Why? Because you already got what you need. You have God. Is God your very great reward? Christians lose faith because of this. Christians fall away because of this. Christians stop trusting because their reward is recognition. Their reward is this. Their reward is that. Their reward is not God. I'm in the kingdom of God for God. The blessing is I get brothers and sisters and friends and all this stuff. But God is my very great reward. Do you feel the same way about God? Verse 2, Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. Abraham goes, okay, Lord, I'm I'm fired up. You're my reward. But there are some things that are kind of jacked up about my life right here. You know, you're going to give me this thing, but I, you know, I kind of need some, you know, I need like a kid (laughs) who you can kind of live through by, you know, can, can you help me out? And he asked questions of God. It's awesome when you ask God questions. Abraham said, you've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and he said, look at the heavens and count the stars. I mean, this is hilarious. He's having this talk with God. He goes, I don't have a son. God goes, I know. Here's what I want you to do. You go outside. And look at the stars. <laughs> He's out there. He's looking. Wow. He's looking at the stars. Okay. I wonder what people thought about him. He must be going crazy. He says, if indeed you can count them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. He believed He just went out and looked at the stars in the sky. He goes, okay, I guess I believe. Nobody did tell him anything. But he believed in God. His faith was in God. This is a radical faith. Just to put your faith in God. To believe. Now chapter 16 is very interesting. What happens in chapter 16? You have Hagar and Ishmael. Sarah begins to do what she begins to lose faith she begins to lose faith they've heard the promise they know they know what the lord said but she begins to lose faith she gets discouraged she says you know maybe i can manipulate the plan of god maybe i can do that after all that makes sense here here, here's the deal Honey, I know you're the leader, but let me tell you what we need to do. Um, No, I thought about it. I thought about it. Um, Why don't you you sleep with Hagar? And that way we can kind of fulfill God's plan. This way. And Abraham, in all his dereliction, 
your father of faith. <laughs> I, I have to believe he got impatient. Why? Because he changed the will of God. God told him, to, just wait. I just showed you the stars. You believe me. Now you're, 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 you're not putting your faith in me. You're putting your faith in your wife. She begins to be a bit manipulative. She was discouraged. I mean, I feel for her. You know, she, she didn't have the children right there. She was probably discouraged about that. You know, sometimes things, things that we believe we're, we're entitled to can discourage us. She gets discouraged. And because of that, she, she, she goes a different direction. Abraham follows her. Um, he gets impatient, I believe. Wife gets discouraged. She begins to manipulate the plan of God. They both compromise. This is a dangerous combination. If you think about it. I, I start thinking about this manipulation, discouragement, impatience, compromise. You mix these things on up into a bowl of soup and you are eating something that's going to make your stomach feel real bad. I'm reminded of Oleg right there. Yeah. It's a, the, stomach, the stomach starts feeling, oh, this doesn't feel good inside. Yeah. Dangerous, dangerous combination. Yeah. She gives birth to Ishmael. Ishmael represents the flesh. God says you don't need to live by the flesh. You need to live by faith. But both of them started living by the flesh. And, you know, you say, what do you learn? You need to have faith in your marriage. There's a lot to learn here. Amen. But just, just there. It's not enough for him to have faith. She's got to have faith. Yeah. And your faith can't be in each other. It's got to be in God. Yeah. You've got to put your faith in God. You've got to put your trust in God. I, I, I just, it's just so crystal clear. Abraham and Sarah stop trusting God here. And put their faith in one another. Manipulate it, compromise. And this will always get you in trouble. Chapter 17, verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old. Oh my goodness. 99 years old. You guys catch that? 24 years since the calling. 24 years. We lose faith in 24 hours. It takes us 24 hours, and all of a sudden, oh, 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 24 years living by faith. How many disciples over 20 years in the, here in London? Please stand up. Give these disciples a round of applause. Living by faith. Brothers, sisters, you got examples. Heard the promise way back then. Still putting their trust in God. Still living by faith. 24 years on in. You going to be here 24 years from now? You going to be here? Or you going to get sucked out into the world because of your flesh? You going to live a life of Ishmael or a life of Isaac? You're going to be here. You can if you put your faith in God and live by faith. Let's keep going. Verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him. He says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me. Be blameless. I'll confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your number. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You'll be my, the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you father of many nations. I'll make you very fruitful. I'll make nations of you and kings will come from you. Verse 9. Then God said to Abram, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for, the, for generations to come. This is the covenant with you and your descendants. After you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised you're to undergo circumcision and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you he says i know now you've been doing it intellectually you've been living. now i want to see an outward sign of your faith i want to see an act i want, I want you to do something you got to get circumcised <laughs> verse 13 it says whether born in your household or bought with your money they must be circumcised my covenant in your flesh 
is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken the covenant. Abraham is 99 years old and he's got to get circumcised. That convicting? That's faith, isn't it? He could have said, you know, I'm too old for this. You ever heard that one nowadays? It's for the young people. Because, you know, circumcision was supposed to be eight days after. It's for the kids. Why eight days? Because you could bleed to death if you're circumcised on the seventh day. Isn't God awesome? He's a scientist too. God knew that you only can do it eight days. That's when the body is actually strongest. That's when the blood coagulates on the eighth day. That's when you have enough proteins to, for the blood to actually clot, to keep you alive. You get, you get circumcised on the seventh day, you can bleed to death. God, people always say, oh, God against science. No, no, no. God and science work together. This is not God or, for those of you that are scientific in, 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 in here. But Abraham's years old and he's got to get circumcised. I know we don't think, and of course this is the physical circumcision, but we understand it's spiritual implications in the New Testament. Doesn't matter how old you are, you still need to have a circumcised heart. And this is a real challenge for the Romans because the Jews had thought, well, that's good for those guys, not for us. And then the, the young guys looked down and hey, hey, look at you, you need your heart circumcised. And everybody fell short. But I was very moved by this that Still 99 years old. He's living by faith and is willing to get circumcised. All the young people, all the men got circumcised. No Israelite, no true disciple, dare we say, from this point here, would be able to be involved in a sex act without believing and knowing you belong to God. Every single male, every time they got ready to be with their wife, they remember that circumcision and go, I belong to God. I know that's how you feel if you're single. You belong to God. You've been baptized. You've been circumcised. You belong to God. God owns you. You're married to God. He is your very great reward. Is that not awesome? Chapter 18. He visits three angels and they tell him, hey, bro, you're going to have a kid in about a year that's about nine months so the gestation right there just the math guys and so she gets pregnant and you know so just wanted to help you out with that one that right there uh, and then we get to chapter 20 he has a little lapse in faith his wife is very beautiful he runs into an evil king he says uh oh she's my sister let me just kind of and that's partially true but it gets a little deceitful right here. And he says, hey, honey, I want you, I want you, you, know, I want you to go in there and tell him you're my sister. She was his wife. You know what she did? She did it. Yeah. Talk about a reason to stop living by faith. She didn't even count her body hers. She counted her body the Lord's. Amen. And even if he would allow her to go through that, she still didn't break faith. Now you get a picture of the people that represent your mother and father of faith. How much they put their faith in God. That this was a woman who was willing to allow this ungodly act to happen to her and still be able to go. God is still my great, very great reward. I'm just lucky to be alive. And he stood, and then you start, it puts into perspective how things are going on in your marriage. We lose faith because our husband doesn't do the dishes. <laughs> Can't believe he makes me do the dishes. After everything, I, we, we get emotional, I went through, you know how I am. We break down. You see what I mean? Yeah. But doesn't this give you a perspective? And you can put the shoe on the other foot. Imagine if you were a brother. And some things had to happen. Our mother and father of faith were very radical. Abraham was radical. Sarah was radical. Their hope and their trust was in God. Even through this fumble, they still, she still put her trust in God. She didn't divorce him. She didn't leave him. You know, oftentimes we have tough things happen to us in our relationship. And I'm talking about within the church. And when tough things happen, we leave the church. 
I don't know what could be worse than this. Yet all bad things that happen, God is still in control. God is sovereign. He's still sovereign. Look at chapter 21. You guys still with me here? The Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said. And the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore him a son to Abraham in his old age. At the very time God had promised him, Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac bore to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I've borne him a son in his old age. Now, what's funny about that is Isaac means he laughs because she laughed at God earlier. She laughed at, we didn't read it, but she, she laughed at God. I was like, you're right. I'm a women's <laughs> ministry leader. <laughs> it ain't happening for me. Woo, I'm not going to, uh-uh, I'm not going to go into ministry. Uh-uh. And then it happened. It was awesome. She laughed. She laughed. So God gave a child named Isaac, which means he laughs. God, God hears that laughter. There's something in your life you're laughing about right now. You're like, <laughs> I'm not moving there. <laughs> I'll ne and don't do this. Don't say, I'll never do this. So if you say, I'll never move here, never go here, that's exactly where you're going. Just, just trust it. Just trust it. And you'll laugh about it. I felt that way about Vancouver, Washington. I hated Vancouver. It was weird. It was boring. It was where the worst things happened to me in my life. It was where all the nerds and the uh, odd people lived. And uh, Michelle and I had to go to Vancouver to build the Vancouver ministry. And we had all of everybody with us. We had the Holy Spirit, Michelle, and I. Just both of us. We went there, and Michelle was pregnant. We went there, and I was just the worst thing. In it. And, I, and I was like, I'll never go to Vancouver. And then we wound up going to Vancouver, Washington. It was the best place for us. God moved in one of the most radical ways in our lives. Where, where are you laughing at God at? And not living by faith. Chapter 22 is the test. Chapter 22 is the test. Verse 2. Then God said, Oh, no, verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Said to Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your one and only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Of course, that's where Jesus was killed. Uh, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on, a, on the mountain I will tell you about. Very early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. Of course, as the account goes, Isaac has to take the wood. Isaac has to take the uh, wood up the hill. And then, of course, the Bible says, in verse 8, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went together. Then, when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there, arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand, took his knife to slay his son. But an angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. He said, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God. Now I know you have faith in me because of your action. Because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. I just, now I know. This is God saying, now I know. This is the Almighty who should already know. No, no, no. I, I, I never saw this as long as I've been a disciple. God doesn't know everything. He doesn't know everything. He doesn't know what, you're, he doesn't know what decisions you're going to make. He knows, you, he knows you what the consequences of the decisions you may make, but he doesn't know what decision you're going to make until you make it. He says, now I know. Abraham could have said, mm, I'm not going to do it. And God, eh, yeah, I know what happens when people don't do it. But he did it. God gives us free choice. And I think we have a mindset like, well, God knows what's going to happen anyway. No, 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 no. He doesn't know. He's, he's, he's wanting to see if you're really living by faith. He's wanting to see if you're really willing to put your faith 
and your deeds together. Of course, we know Isaac did it here, or Abraham did it. He was willing to sacrifice Isaac. And of course, spiritually, you see the history. You see Abraham, then you see Isaac, then you see Jacob. And then after Jacob, Jacob gives birth, and he has one of the sons, which is Joseph. Joseph was incredible. Joseph, in my opinion, was one of the most radical men in the Old Testament. Why? He had character. There's nothing negative said about Joseph in the entire account of his life. He has the longest, of, he even has a longer account written about him than Abraham. Not once do you say, see that Joseph got bitter when let down by his brothers. Not once do you hear that Joseph got angry when criticized and not believed in by his brothers. Not once do you see him ticked off at God for letting him be around some non-Christian woman who wasn't doing well in her marriage and struggling with young brothers. And then he goes to jail over it. Not once is he mad at God. He kept living by faith all the way down. And what's even more powerful about Joseph is he kept living by faith all the way up. That's a real test of your faith. When things seem to be going further down and you still don't charge God with wrongdoing, keep living by faith. But then even more tough when God begins to bless your life because he came, became prime minister. He still was living by faith. Why? He forgave. He forgave his brothers. He forgave. He, he forgave God. He saw everything that happened in his life was the hand of God. And so to, uh, just two incredible examples. But Joseph comes from Abraham. He comes from Abraham. Radical. Radical. Incredible examples of living by faith. Now you understand that. Let's go back to Romans chapter 4. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about. But not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now when a man works, his wages are credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. And then he says in verse 7, blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not count against him and the church said I mean first of all do you see the radical faith of Abraham and he comes to this point he says blessed is the man whose sins God won't count against them you know we're gonna hear from Paul Fuller today and of course this this scripture comes from Genesis chapter 15 and you know Paul's gonna share his life and under the law, it is wrong to, dare we say, be involved in murder under the law. But when you're justified by God, it's justified, never sinned. God justifies you. God stands in front of you. Your faith is in God. And the law doesn't condemn you because God saves you. And from a legal standpoint, you go, somebody's committed something this, this bad. But you know what? None of his sins are counted against him by God. None of his sins. If you're a baptized disciple, you're not justified by law. God doesn't count your sins against you. I think sometimes we, we, we are harder on ourselves than God is. God has forgiven your sin and you're beating yourself up. But oftentimes we beat ourselves up because we don't confess our sins. And so that guilt runs in our heart. But if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive you of your sins. That's the power right there. And so as we come to a close, here in Romans chapter 4, Paul makes the argument. Abraham was justified by faith. We are justified by faith if we put our faith in God if we're willing to live by faith now are we willing to live by faith 
Are we willing to live by faith? We're going to go to regions. Some of you are going to be asked to go. Some of you are going to be asked to stay. Now, we've already just explained your sins are forgiven. Got a great example of Abraham. He left his country. We're just going to ask you to leave your postcode. <laughs> Will you live by faith? Will you get fired up and go, absolutely, I'm leaving the east, I'm going west. Absolutely, I'm leaving the west, I'm going north. Absolutely, I'm leaving the north, I'm going south. See, I love Michael and Maria. They live in the north, but they're going down to the south. You know why? They're living by faith. They're not going, you know, we've been justified by works. We've been live, we live off. We've already done that before. Like the Jews. No, they're living still, still doing it by faith. You may be asked to go. You may be asked to stay. I challenge you to live by faith and obey. We have our special mission contribution. It's a, it's a faith issue. It's a faith issue. Say, I don't have any money. Ask your friends. I don't have any friends. Uh-oh, we got a bigger, bigger problem. We got a bigger problem. Our special missions contribution is not in some ways even for us. It's for all those out there who aren't righteous, who are living by feelings, who are living by fear, who are living by race, who are living by socioeconomic status, who are living by culture, who are living by science, who are living by humanism who are living by all these things that will not save them. So we've got to live by, we've got to blow out our missions contribution. Eight times, 32,000 is what we're trying to raise. I pray we blow it out. With discipling, we're going to regions. I pray we have faith. We live by faith. We have the faith of Abraham. We just trust God. You're going to have young leaders. You're going to have old leaders. Live by faith. And lastly, we've got to convert hearts. Amen. It's not enough for you to teach people the law. It's not enough to be living by the law. Enough of that. There's a lot of people that believe intellectually what we believe, but they don't believe in what we believe because they're not willing to live by it. And we need to have deep convictions as we go to regions that we need to live by faith. We've got to convert hearts. It's not enough to want to be baptized. That, that's not enough. You're going to want to be a disciple. And when, you, when you're a disciple, that means you've been given a new purpose to go and make disciples. Why do people fall away? They don't understand their purpose. They get baptized and they sit there. Stop living by faith. They live by faith all the way up until that point and then they sit there. And they wonder why they get numb. But then we stop living by faith because we don't call them to live by faith. We just call them to the law. That's not good enough. Paul has to argue that with the church. It's not enough. The law, you got to live by it, guys. Yeah. Are, are you with me here? Yeah. So as we close, I, I really want to challenge you today. Get fired up about going to regions. Yeah. Get fired up about special mission contribution. Yeah. Let's convert hearts and let's make sure that whether we have young or old, that we say, hey, we're going to get behind our brother, our sister, and we'll live by faith. God bless you.